My name is Tim Longhurst, I'm a futurist and I've been a part of the futures community in Australia for about seven years and I suppose one of the things that makes me special is that I feel that I'm a bridge between two worlds. Uh, on one hand, I've been actively involved at the frontiers of change with the, the activist community in Australia, but at the same time I've managed to carve opportunities for myself in the corporate world and uh, so I suppose since you asked what makes me special I, I like to think that I can be a bridge between uh, two conversations or conversations that should be should be one but are too often yeah, two. Yeah. Uh, when you say you are futurist uh, yes. can you explain this a little bit I mean just to get an understanding you know what what is your idea behind being a futurist sure so, a lot of futurists like to see, like to describe what they contribute to as building a capacity for foresight inside organisations. And what we see in the world too often is governments and uh, corporations, various organisations, making decisions that are based on assumptions about the future that may prove to be false. And so, the work of futurists is in part about the work of unpacking assumptions and asking two important questions. The first is, what's going on out there in the world? And the second is, what are the, what are the possibilities? And when you say the world, mm. let's, let's use a synonym for the word, let's use we, since we're doing sure. this for We Magazine. When you're talking about the worlds out there, yes. what, what are the we's out there? Well, there are, which you look at? As yeah. a futurist. Well, there are multiple we's uh, in the spirit of the magazine. Uh, in terms of in Australia, we have various uh, identities and communities. In terms of uh, the work that I do, a lot of the time, uh, professionally, I'm looking at uh, markets and, and professional opportunities, but also uh, in my work with GetUp, which is one of uh, Australia's largest community based change organisations we're looking at social justice and sustainability. So there is, a, there is a different way again. How would you describe these two ways? You said in your introduction that they hardly bridge. Sure. Uh, well, I suppose there are, there are people that bridge because, well, I mean, the most obvious place that they bridge is that the people as individuals, in my experience in Australia, often do hold the ideals of social justice and sustainability very close to their heart. But today, they don't necessarily see the businesses and the organisations that they find themselves working for in a professional capacity expressing those same uh, ideals. And so the bridge to be built is often a an internal bridge that needs to be built. So there are people, uh, for example, when my organisation, which is called Key Message, when we hold internal workshops within organisations, often the conversation in terms of what's happening in the world we look at, we use hooks on which to hang our ideas. So socially, how is the world changing or how is our world changing environmentally, politically, technologically, uh, organisationally, economically? And how did you get, I mean, we spent the last weekend together at this Gathering 11, mm. there was a lot of social movement and we talked a lot about participation mm. and kind of thing. These, these crowds out there, these crowd movements, how do you get these ideas, which definitely define environment, which define consumer markets and, 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 how do you get these thoughts into the company? Well, yeah, so, so with Key Message, what we do is we invite people to uh, discuss internally how is the world changing and what are the possibilities. And as soon as you have an internal conversation in all of the organisations that we've dealt with, the conversations are actually quite rich, they're robust, and the same concerns that were raised and explored in the Gathering 11 could actually happen in most professional services firms or government departments, because uh, the people who work in professional services firms or government departments are sharing the same world that the participants of Gathering 11 are sharing. It's just that at the Gathering 11, people were given permission to go into those conversations deeply, Whereas professionally, rarely are people invited to discuss the way the world's changing and where the opportunities ought to be. Speak up.
but how do you get the companies come to you or how do you get to the companies because you're saying that once you talk and have a conversation within the company right. things happen but then it seems that the company has a shell that you need to break yes how, how do you do that uh, well the, a way that I like to put it is that uh, most organi any organism survives by being able to identify nutrition and poison and avoid the poison and absorb the nutrition. And so for in, 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 corp in the corporate world, uh, organisms are very reluctant to take what might be perceived as poison. And that means that uh, professionally, the way that Key Message we present ourselves is we talk about the benefits of having these deep conversations. And the benefits include uh, staff retention, staff engagement, uh, recruitment opportunities, so when people are satisfied at work, they're less likely to leave. And so that's what we talk about when we're talking to uh, businesses that are interested in bringing us on board. To become a little bit more precise, and sure. uh, maybe I'm a little bit naughty now, but... <laughs> <laughs> Go for it! <laughs> uh, how do you, I mean, conversations are very nice. Yes. I think they are very important. But if all you have are conversations, and the end of the day, you know, it won't lead you anywhere. How do you translate all these ideas, all these conversations in real action? How do you really drive the change within a company? I mean, we've been talking about the edge and the core and blah, blah, blah. Uh, how do you really do it? Well, I think that one of the things that I've noticed is that when an organization commits to having a company-wide conversation, and for example, recently we had an organization that took more than 300 of their staff, put them in one large center and engaged in a conversation about, about uh, what the possibilities were. Well, what the CEO made a commitment to do is return within 12 months and demonstrate how various uh, parts of the company were involved in making real some of the possibilities that were identified. Over a thousand opportunities were identified in that process, so they won't all be explored. But to the company's credit, they've put real resources behind it, and uh, so and people from uh, across the organisation have become part of an innovation working group, and so it will be interesting to see how that progresses. This is fairly this is a fairly new approach, but I think it's fantastic to see an organisation go from conversation into a commitment for action. And part of it, part of the reason that they've that they've allocated resources, is because there's a tsunami called the internet moving through their industry, and they're. And, Organizations, most organizations now recognize that life today isn't what it was two or three, let alone 10 years ago. And so what we're seeing, in, certainly in some businesses, not all, is a recognition that uh, what used to account for strategic planning, it doesn't necessarily work anymore. And that organizations need to find ways to evolve quicker than perhaps uh, any of the managers ever imagined. I mean, why did it take so long for them to realize that the internet is there? Um, they weren't really challenged, or Australia has a unique answer to why the internet might not have been a, yeah. a major threat. Uh, one of the things we have is what we often refer to as the tyranny of distance, and that is that the, to move packages from Europe or North America to Australia is expensive. Ad additionally, we've had a currency that up until the last 12 months has not been particularly robust and so purchasing from overseas hasn't been a very desirable act for those two reasons. The purchasing power of the Australian dollar doesn't go very far and then when you add on uh, the, the cost of freight you've got uh, what might have been more competitive markets in for example Europe or the United States hasn't necessarily translated into a competitive market in Australia. Australia has just over 20 million people and so we're a relatively small market and economically we're a market uh, full of oligopolies that is only one or two major players in any industry it hasn't necessarily served their interests to adopt to, to the internet quickly they already had very solid distribution models uh, for example the two supermarket chains uh, dominate uh, online retail sorry retail in australia not online dominate retail uh. and so what's happened recently what's happened very recently is uh, the logistics companies overseas have gotten more efficient with their delivery with their delivery and distribution the times have reduced in terms of delivery of items but further the australian dollar has uh, strengthened 
in, uh, in recent times and all of a sudden it's quite competitive for uh, Australian consumers to purchase from other markets. Yeah, I, I'm very interested in the, in the way the companies get to, um, to change and adopt their new ways of thinking and new ways of acting and new ways to create value and uh, to how this change comes from the top towards the bottom or how it can come from the grassroots and then diffuse within the organization and if mm. you have things to write and say about it I think it would be quite interesting yeah in terms that could be useful for others to you know how can the we be rolled out better into mm. corporations for instance for yep. the grassroots to push their um, uh, their management or, or for, for a wave to come into the, the corporate uh, world I think one way is to hold a brown bag lunch what they call it so bring your brown bag and sit in a boardroom or sit in an office uh, you know, sit, sit in a communal environment and have a conversation. Bring someone from outside the organisation in to talk about an aspect of the world that others might not have considered. And it's quite fun. You can do it once a week or once a month, whatever people can handle. But even something like bringing someone who has a completely different experience of the, of the world to what the people in your, in your team or in your business have can be very disruptive and it can be incredibly enlightening. So that's, I mean, that's, that, I mean, that's not necessarily going to be the, the major transformation in an organisation, but it can spark the kind of conversations that might not have happened otherwise. Yes, I like to say that uh, it would be interesting to, to start coffee machine conversations in all businesses on how change can come about and how to build better ways of doing businesses, bi business. I think those coffee machine conversations are happening. They have been happening uh, all over the years. The, the thing is that uh, as long as John would say the core isn't attracted by it, or as long as the edges you know, aren't, aren't uh, significant enough, they uh, won't probably drive the change. And I, it, oh. Oh, sorry, Griffin. Well, I think also there's a big issue of enablement. People want to do things and they don't know where to start and, and how, how they start. can yeah. and how they can spark something and that's where you jump mm. in. Well, um, I would say that there, there are two people. Uh, I think Pete Williams from uh, from Melbourne has a, he has a very nice video that I can send you the link to. Please. And it's him talking about how the limits that most people imagine in professional in the professional world often don't exist. And that certainly within him and his team, he encourages people to uh, f pursue their passions or what they think will work and just keep running and running until they find their limit. But nowhere, at no time, has he found someone that's following a, a hunch, a professional, a, you know, a professional opportunity or what have you. And he said, no, 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 stop. And, and that includes you know, growing the business in other ways. I would say that Tom Peters also has a lot to offer. I found Tom's books quite, um, quite inspiring and, and Tom's book is all about how to inspire change inside your organisations. He's very no nonsense, I don't know if you've read any of his stuff, yeah. I mean he writes for an American audience but it's... Um, he's Australian? No, 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 he's actually American. Okay. Yeah, but, uh, but I, find, I, I think that in terms of you know, the broader conversation about how to spark change in organisations, he, he, talks, he, likes, he has a book called The Project 50. And he talks about creating a wow project inside an organisation and how to how to uh, you know, bring your team or an organisation with you. And one of the ways he um, encourages us to think about the projects that we bring in organisations or the change that we'd like to bring inside a business is how do you how do you decorate the project? How do you put, how do you how do you uh, create a space for it and uh, almost an experience of your project? That makes others curious yeah. and maybe even a little, <coughs> maybe even a little envious. When you usually go into a company and start work with them, mm. I mean, change is not something which will happen overnight. Sure. How long are you usually working with them? Are you also a consultant during the change process, or do you step back? 
and let the company do it by themselves? Uh, it varies. More often than not, the reason I, mean, I walk into the room is because there's a specific moment in the corporation's life that calls for an outside perspective. And it's usually something like a strategic planning process or something where you can reasonably expect to have a budget to bring an outsider in to talk about how the world's changing. But generally speaking, my presentations don't give everyone permission to go back to business as usual. And so from there, it becomes a relationship. What are the major challenges you are seeing for, for Australia in terms of economy, in terms of education, in terms of politics? I mean, it's something like open government. Is this an issue here? If you go through various fields, what are the challenges? Well, uh, there, are, there are plenty of challenges. I like to look at the opportunities, but the... the, the yeah, I mean, they always yeah, go for, along with them. Sure, okay, but I mean, in terms, of, in terms of challenges, one of the challenges we've got is that we are very fortunate to have an abundance of natural resources that just so happen to be in demand by the world's developing economies. And I'm speaking of uh, iron ore and coal and to a lesser degree at this stage uranium. And so we've got an abundance of even rare earths, for example. So we've got a very strong mining uh, sector at the moment. And that's causing challenges in terms of structural challenges. Mm. It just so happens that the resources aren't where the population is. If uh, your readers see a map of Australia, the majority of Australia's population are in the uh, southeast corner of the island yeah. and, or continent. And, it, and, most, and, and many of the resources that are so sought after by Asia are in the, in the, uh, in the northwest uh, yeah. corner of the country. And so we've got an issue where Western Australia, which is our Western state that has so many of these resources, is currently saying that they, they require an additional 150,000 uh, people uh, for jobs. And we've got a situation where people, where people in the southeastern states aren't necessarily um, rushing to take those opportunities. Okay. However, people who do are uh, being quite well financially remunerated. So that leads to an expression that's become uh, quite commonplace in Australia and that refers to a two-speed economy. That we've got uh, those businesses that are exposed to the, um, the fruits of the mining boom and everyone else. Are there any cha challenges or opportunities regarding the internet? Like I was asking, yeah. open, open governments are you? Yeah, and uh, actually our, our tech community has really embraced the opportunities within, uh, within government. We've actually got a situation where the government's official Hansard is, be, is competing with an unofficial open Hansard. So the records okay. of parliament are being organised by um, an open Australia organisation and they're doing a really great job of managing the Australian parliamentary records. We had a, um, a small startup launch at the end of last year called Tweet MP, which is about linking uh, uh, members of parliament around Australia to their Twitter profiles and then allowing people to actively lobby those members of parliament who don't have active Twitter yeah. profiles yeah. and explain to those members of parliament how Twitter, a simple social networking system, can enhance accountability and transparency yeah. in government. Yeah. So I mean that's a, that's a modest example but yeah we are seeing the tech community see the, um, the opportunities and to their credit uh, some governments in Australia are trying to bridge the gap in terms of the data that they hold, which ought to be open with the citizens. And so, for example, we've seen the New South Wales government uh, open up a lot of their, a lot of data to applications and, uh, and, and mashups. So it's, it's very, it's at its uh, early stages, but yeah, we are seeing, uh, we're, we're seeing opportunities for greater involvement in government. At Gathering 11, we were talking about uh, the uh, social changes driven by new technologies. What are the opportunities there? Which fields do you see will be uh, the first ones to adapt to these, uh, let's, let's call it new requirements by the crowd, by the citizens, by the people? I think there are really, there are great opportunities in health. We have, okay. we have, uh, in some ways what you might describe universal health care in Australia and that means that there are there are government opportunities for cost savings that would be uh, 
that they would appreciate. But also, I think there are opportunities for uh, higher levels of care and uh, feedback from patients in terms of yeah. where the needs are. And so I'd say health is one of the early opportunities. Australians, Australians recognise that in terms of uh, the ideal of universal health, we have it quite good. In terms of the reality of the service provision, there are significant waiting lists that, uh, that aren't necessarily as transparent as they could be. And so I think that, yeah, you'd have to say that health would be an, an, early, uh, an early industry to feel the, the full weight of, uh, of open government. What's next? Which industry? Uh, what's next in terms of? In terms of, you know, that really social change driven by new technologies mm. uh, uh, needs to be. Uh, sure, I'd say I'd say education. Have... I'd say education would be what's next. Education? Why? Because I think education is being redefined by the web. I think that uh, what we're seeing from, and Australia isn't leading in this field, but what we're seeing in other markets is universities, for example, in America, start to grapple with the reality that, that they are actually organisations that offer qualifications, not strictly speaking education. And that means that they can comfortably publish lectures on the web for free on the understanding that whilst many people may attend a Harvard lecture or a Stanford lecture, only some will actually be qualified as graduates of Harvard or Stanford programs. Yeah. And we're yet to see the Australian university, universities or the tertiary sector um, embrace sharing their knowledge in an, open, in an open manner, and I think that's a yeah. shame. However, we are seeing technology being, being harnessed by everyday Australians to educate around their areas of interest, whether it be uh, stories from older Australians or uh, Indigenous or First Australians telling their stories. And so the opportunities for education in the next few years are really, I think, very exciting. Yeah. Do you have any specific change maker story under this umbrella, social change driven by new technologies here in Australia, which you really say, this is it? Um, I think that. An organisation I've had a bit to do with, which is GetUp, is a really exciting example uh, of technology linked to change. So GetUp is an organisation that has around 550,000 Australians as members, which means we've got more members than all the political parties combined. And it's a grassroots democracy organisation. And I can tell you, as the former head of strategy at GetUp, it's a very responsive organisation that cares deeply about the concerns of members. And what that means is that, for example, the organisation has employed user voice to allow members to describe campaigns they would like to see the organisation run. And when the political opportunity uh, presents itself, GetUp can act very quickly to mobilise many of its members towards the, uh, the end, the outcome that the members are seeking. And so what that means is that whether the issue is around, for example, uh, when we recently had a situation where graphic footage of the mistreatment of Australian animals in Indonesian uh, uh, abattoirs was put on television, Get Up Within Hours responded by launching a campaign and saw hundreds of thousands of Australians lobby the government to put an immediate freeze on the, on the live export of animals. And the government res responded, and at this point we've got a, at this point while this is being recorded, we've got a situation where uh, animals that were bound for Indonesia are now sitting uh, in Australia and they're not going to leave until the, ind the meat industry has, made, has persuaded the government that they've taken steps to make sure that, 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 animals that are, Australian animals that are sent overseas, certainly to Indonesia, mm -hmm. uh, won't be treated in, in the way that we saw in that footage. So, that was a, that was, so that's an example of Australians being able to act incredibly quickly mm -hmm. through technology. Uh, do they also act actively or are they waiting for things to happen and then we act like in the thing you just described? Sure. Um, I know there's, there's, um, there's, there's both. I mean that was a fantastic example of a reactive campaign but they're also quite, they're, it's also a proactive organisation and uh, there's a, a number of campaigns around for example putting a price on pollution where they haven't necessarily waited for, uh, for any, any single government action 
the, the fact is that the, one of the touchstone issues of our generation is how Australia and the world responds to the scientific consensus on climate change. And so the way that GetUp has responded with, with its membership has been consistently finding small campaigns that can mobilise Australians towards an outcome that, uh, that future generations can be proud of. Yeah. So how would you define the we in Australia? Is there something like a common we and what are the values? For you? Yeah, for me, uh, I think yeah, I think there is uh, there's there's a common narrative. I think that uh, I can uh, perhaps I can speak to what many Australians see, and uh, I think that reasonably the a, an expression that we took describe in Australia is is the ideal of a fair go. That That's the what? We call it a fair go. F A I R G O. Okay. Fair okay. Go. That is yeah. I think that if you ask many Australians this question you would more often than not get that answer. And the idea of a fair go is that uh, regardless of your circumstances, you're entitled to some, uh, you know, some support from your fellow citizens and uh, not, yeah, so basically if that's, um, you might not be born with uh, a lot of means, but that doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't get a quality education or be taken care of if you are sick. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's one of the ideals of Australia in terms of which makes it quite an egalitarian country. And for you, as a futurist, what is your better we? If you have to have a vision, or if you have to describe your vision on this, I feel that we have a unique opportunity in Australia to benefit from our current resources boom and position ourselves for. For example, the renewable energy economies of the future. So we have a lot of the, the raw materials that are required to build wind turbines and wave energy. We have great opportunities for geothermal energy in the future. And at the moment, we've got a situation where the world is moving towards uh, renewable energy and Australia hasn't necessarily kept up with the pace of change because it's easy to be comfortable when you've got this much raw materials and so this, you know, this abundance. And so I, I do wonder if, um, I, I know, along with many Australians, if, if, we, uh, if we perhaps will look back in, in decades to come and think that there was, a, there was an opportunity for us to position ourselves very effectively, not just for this boom, but the next one. And uh, sometimes it's easy to be complacent, and I suspect that uh, we may we may look back and and shake our heads at the complacency. So what are you basically saying is that Australia has the unique chance to connect closer to this global view to the rest of the world? Is That's this a, what you say? Yeah. Well, uh, we, okay. So if if uh, given that the given that many scientists tell us that we've got a situation where the, car the carbon in our atmosphere is 30% more than we've seen in the last million years. And that's going to cause challenges and we need to yeah. somehow mitigate our, um, our carbon emissions. In Australia we have just over 20 million people. We've got a massive continent that is surrounded by coastline for wave power, wind for you know, wind energy, solar, more sun hits this part of the world than pretty much any other. Right. If we can't have a renewable energy economy in this country, then what do we expect for countries with more than a billion people like China or India? We ought to be demonstrating, and also we've got the wealth. We're incredibly educated by world standards. Uh, we, we're quite healthy, we live, we live long, healthy, reasonably happy lives. So I, I think it's a, it's a shame to have all of this, all of this abundance and for us to not see the opportunity and the obligation to show the world that when you are rich, powerful, e educated and you know, have this abundance of resources that you ought to be able to turn around and say, look, let us, let us lead, let us demonstrate that, it is, that another world is possible, that we can have comfortable, happy lives where we travel and uh, you know, move, move around at, at will, uh, but do it in a sustainable manner. And we haven't seen a lot of investment or move towards that, not, not considering our wealth. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.